Hey everyone, we are finally back. With me as always is Corey. Say hi, Corey. Hey, how's it going? And I think we mentioned back in our previous video back in the day that it would be a while because what we really needed to work on next was the boss fight. And we don't want to reveal the boss fight to the public yet. So that's why we've been gone a while. We've been making really good progress with the boss's design and boss fight mechanics and AI and all that stuff, but we can't show it yet. So for now, eventually though, I am recording videos of that process of programming the boss. So once the boss is public, I will release those videos. But in the meantime, there is other stuff we need to also work on. And one of the big ones was the splash screen slash main menu. And then uh, to a smaller degree, secondary menu settings, options, that kind of stuff. We needed that at least partially functional as well. So that's what we're going to be talking about in this particular video. And uh, so we'll start with the splash screen. And before you program and get anything working in a game, it's a good idea to basically mock it up, especially if you're two artists making the game like Corey and I. You really want to know what you need to do, what you need to manipulate, how it needs to move. So let's get into what we've been working on here. All right, so the first thing I had to do was create a bunch of new layers because or I don't know if everyone remembers what this looked like before, but it was just a white screen with these placeholder fonts on them and this red arrow. So we knew we wanted to have it sort of scroll in just a little bit to make it a little more lively, show some nice parallax just before everything kind of goes into its final position. So the easiest way to do that is to just extend the size of the layout to be wider than the, just the visible screen so that there's some room to scroll. And then I added a little, what I call a camera sprite. I use the same exact technique for in the game to control the screen scrolling. I create a sprite called the camera because if you just put the, uh, what is it called? Scroll to behavior directly on your player character then there's very little you can do to customize the scrolling or control the scrolling in special circumstances other than just turning it off or on as the behavior. Whereas if you separate it out as an object, you can much more easily do really specific rubber banding or easing and all like you could do at that point, you can do anything you want with the camera. And in this case, not only did I give it the scroll to behavior, which is if you give something that behavior and there's room for scrolling, meaning the layout is bigger than the actual screen window size, wherever you move that sprite, the game automatically scrolls to try to center that object on the window. Mm -hmm. And so not only did I add that, but I also gave it a move to behavior. And what that allows you to do is to just in one action or one event, say, move this sprite from where it is to a new location. And the cool thing is right here, you can set its max speed and also acceleration and deceleration. And depending on how high or if you set a numeric value other than zero, it's going to have easing in and out. And I did not want easing in, so acceleration I kept to zero. Like you would think zero would mean that it's just never going to move. Right. Yep. But no, zero mm -hmm. means basically don't have an ease and just start at max speed. So that, okay. that's a little confusing until you mess with it. And then deceleration, obviously, I want a little bit of a nice smooth ease in as it's coming to a stop. So I just gave it a relatively low number. And with the, this stuff, until you're super used to it at the given resolution you're working in, it's just a bunch of messing around until it feels right. So all I do is start it over here. You can see that it's off center to the visible screen. So it starts here and then I move it to somewhere like here so that it just, it's just enough as it's fading in to have a nice little bit of movement to make it feel like you're looking into a world instead of staring at a static image. And so that was the first thing. And then just adding all the layers. And the other important thing is when you get in your layers, if you want that nice sense of depth with the parallax, what you want is to set your parallax at different rates at lower values, the farther back it is. So the background image with the clouds and mountains, there's no scrolling. And then there's the foreground of the environment, which is already at 100%. But then I 
made the character that is 125%, so he'll scroll faster than the foreground. Mm -hmm. And so I'll just show you how that looks. Yeah, I noticed you made the faster scrolling portion mm -hmm. pretty long, and I'm curious how much of that ends yeah. up on screen. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that was just sloppy work to get it working, and I have a missing gap of graphics when I was done. Yeah, my thinking is, you know, I can make it about as wide as the entire screen. Exactly. Or so. I think that's yeah. what we talked about. And then yeah. you should be able to adjust it, I guess, to make it look right in terms of the speed. I just didn't want to, like, draw a huge yeah, exactly. strip of something that isn't ever going to be seen. Or right. Not only does that waste time, but if you're doing the whole design based on stuff people are never going to see, then the design itself is going to suffer. So it wastes time right. and you end up with inferior visuals. But what we can do is make sure that we both agree that the amount of scrolling of everything compared to everything else is perfect. And once we really like that, then I can bring in the size of this thing until we do get the missing graphic showing. And then I know I've gone too far. And that way I can get the exact width that you're going to need. Right, where yeah. everything's going to be showing in that way we know it will look as good as possible based on the best looking scroll ratio yeah my thinking yeah. the scrolling like because what you had there obviously mm -hmm. i know you said it was just a quick thing but right it moves pretty fast like, yeah oh it's very i don't know fast. it's yeah. a little intense like i'm not opposed to it scrolling a good distance but it definitely right. feels well i don't know i i guess it does need to be yeah, fairly yeah, that's, quick in terms of usability. Right. We don't want it to be too slow, but yeah. So the trick I is, yeah, like always get it working, and then there's going to need to be iteration time, and we yeah. really should iterate on this. But we don't have to do that in this video. We should it, because this this video series is more about how you make it work, not so much as how you polish it once it does work, which right. is just a bunch of monkey work, changing numbers, trying again until it you know really feels good but anyway yeah so so that aside we'll definitely do that off video really make sure it feels right make sure we know exactly how big the graphics should be and right now i just looked at it i feel like 125 wasn't fast enough for the character to come in i, I didn't get a strong sense of parallax separating him from the foreground graphics yeah i agree with that so, he looked, he looked like he was stuck to almost it, yeah. attached to it which definitely needs to be fixed but again we'll work on that off off camera so to speak but anyway and then the other things we added obviously aside from just the placeholder graphics oh and i should mention that too Corey and i spent some time working in a modern uh, layered graphics program we just really quickly scaled some placeholder art and the nice logo made it actual low resolution uh, but you know this isn't cleaned up yet this is just hard scaled down by the program and scaled down but anyway the point is we had a designer's scrum and figured out what looks good where everything needs to fit how many options we want on the main menu like different menu uh, selectable things in the menu and we came up with this a nice design which also obviously it's still unfinished art and this is just a rough digital version of a character illustration I did in a, another video you guys can see on our channel that's not going to be the final pose of the character he's going to be holding his uh, magic gauntlet upward a bit and that flame is going to come on when it's done scrolling like the flame is going to ignite and going to be animated but this gave us the general gist of the layout so that that soon Corey can start doing the actual final environment art and I'm going to be doing the final character art and the interesting thing is we have to coordinate together because this game is actually it's not just retro style we're making it based on the exact graphical limitations of classic Amiga computers so we need to work this all down to fit in a 32 color palette and because we're two different artists that are working on something that all has to be on the screen at the same time, we have to coordinate with each other to make sure I have enough in the right colors for the character, but also he has the right and enough color indexes that he can use for the background to make it all look great and look great together. And we already had from long ago the basic functionality of getting the text. The text was always on screen, and all I did to change that was I also gave this text the same kind of move to behavior and I make it start off of the visible edge of the screen and I just tell it, which I'll show you the code shortly, I just make it move onto screen and I make it a little more complicated. I make them each go onto the screen one at a time. So when one is done moving, the other one comes in and so on. So it has kind of a wave type effect when it's coming in instead of them all coming in at the same time. 
And the other thing that I added was this translucent bar that's behind the character, but in front of the foreground graphics and behind the text. And that just helps reinforce graphically what thing you're selecting at the moment. So again, I'll run it and I'll change the selection of things so you can see how that's working. And then we'll start looking at the actual code. So there it was, it came on screen and then the pointer and the bar up here. And then if I choose, we'll say about, for example, if you look really quickly before the screen fades out, that bar back there is going to go from a dark background color to a white color. And the other options that you did not select are going to disappear. And that's to emphasize that you've made your selection and it leaves the relevant one on screen for that split second as it fades out. And then we've got this beautiful already previously finished about screen. And then when you're done <laughs> scrolling through to that, it just automatically brings you back here. And I'm going to show you, but we're going to wait until after we talk about this splash screen main menu code. And then I'm going to show you the really cool design work that Corey has put into the kind of system settings under the hood game options like sound volume versus music volume and all that kind of stuff. So we're working on that menu system as well. But first we're going to stick with the main menu, which is the splash screen. So let's get into the code. Actually, before we do that, it's always a good idea to look at the names of the things you know you're going to want to look up. So menu arrow and selection bar sprite. Okay, so control E to bring us into the event sheet. As you can see, like before, it includes player input event sheet and fade out. That hasn't changed since it was just an ugly white screen. But what did change, obviously I added, oh yeah, we'll do the uh, camera. So this stuff didn't exist before. As you saw, it has a move to behavior and it has the scroll behavior, which is automatic. I think it's yeah, scroll to or something like that. And so all I do is at the start of the layout, I just tell it to move to the X coordinate 190, which will basically center it on the visible screen where it belongs after it's done scrolling. And then its own Y, meaning don't change its Y, don't bother changing its Y coordinate. We don't need to, we just want a perfect horizontal scroll. Right. And so that's all we need for there. And then it's just gonna do it until it's done. And because we added the, what was it called? Deceleration number, it's gonna automatically right. have a nice ease out to the movement. And then you could see here, so it's event 11. We have, has it hit its target? That means, is it done moving to where we told it to? And then that's when we tell the first. So we're checking the menu sprite font. We have three of them on screen. And I have a value for them called which option. And it's zero, one, and two for each one as they go down. So we want the topmost one to start moving. So we're making sure we're controlling specifically that one. So we make sure it's which option value is set to zero. And then we set it to move to the coordinate 210. Same thing, it's keeping its current Y coordinate. So we're not moving that, just a perfect horizontal scroll. And we get that moving. And then, so, oh yeah, I actually didn't end up using this, so I don't need this. You can ignore this. I thought I was going to have the uh, thing scroll back off screen when it was going out, but I decided not to do that. So I can actually remove this to make it simpler. And yeah, me. sometimes it's easy to make that mistake of like getting too fancy with a menu where, where yeah. things will take too much time. And what yeah. people really want from Get interface is like fairly quick feedback and yeah, usability. Exactly. So yeah, exactly. some, sometimes you have to make those little sacrifices yeah. and uh, just yeah. to get it nice and snappy. You know? Yeah, and especially for arcade games and action games. And I also figured out other stuff to do. Like the, the once I had the idea for the bar in the background and it turning white and making the other stuff disappear, that already was very strong visual cues that yes, you made your selection and the screen is fading out. So it was enough and it was nice and snappy. We didn't need to make the player wait while the stuff is flying off screen and all that stuff on top of that. But anyway, so now we have is one of these menu sprite fonts, which is the thing we just got moving. Is it done moving? So on hit target and those kind of things like platformer object on land when something has a move to behavior 
on hit its target, those events need to be the very first event in the event line. So in third event, what is that called? Uh, we'll just call it event or line 13. I guess we'll call it line 13. That mm -hmm. has to be on top. It might make it red or, yeah, it won't even let me move it below. It has to be on top for the logic to make sense because it's a thing that like that code, that event line, it doesn't just trigger just sort of down the sequence and then, oh, well, it didn't happen now. So it's like every event loop of the program, as soon as that happens, it's going to do this thing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then we're checking, make sure it's this first one, which is zero. And then if it is, now we're calling a new function called in one. And the reason I had to separate it into functions or call a function is we have a weird situation. We're talking about one instance of the menu sprite font that just finished moving, but now I don't want to control that when I want to control the next one that has which option value one to tell it to start moving. And, but you, in general, you can't do that in construct because the way the logic automatically works, if you just detected a specific instance of an object just did something, then in your actions, it assumes if you're going to talk about affecting the same type of object, it thinks, oh, obviously you want to affect that one. Because why else would you have just detected that something happened to it? Like it got hit or it finished moving. So the way to get around that is to break up the event into a new line because then it's not forced to assume you're talking about that particular one. So what I did here is call a function. And so we called it in one. And you'll see that all that does on function in one, we go through a for each loop to check all three font menus just to find which one is the one that is the second one down, which is it starts at zero, then it's one. So now we're definitely controlling this one. And we tell it to move to X position 210. And then the same exact thing, once that one is done, you'll see here, if this one is done moving and its value was one, then you call in the function called in two and then on function in two, you make sure it's number two and you move it, which we started from zero. So it's the last one. It's the third option. And then you make that one move. And then when that one's done moving, which is here, there's no other one to make move in. But now once those are done moving in, we finally make the selection arrow appear and the selection bar appear. And that's what these things do, these uh, actions. Mm -hmm. And then we also you see again, we don't use in or out anymore. So I can just get rid of that to keep things simple. And uh, the rest of the functionality was already there. But before the red arrow, uh, before it was static, and it would just uh, move to the y coordinate of whichever option you were selecting. But I also added a horizontal sine wave behavior to it. So it has that nice little kind of organic, I'm pointing at this movement. Mm -hmm. That's all I did there. And then the other thing, like I said, every event, I just looked for the events that affect the Y coordinate of menu arrow. So we'll go back to the code and we'll look at menu arrow. So we're looking for, okay, so see here, set Y to this. Actually, it looks like I missed one here. Oh, every tick, I did it that way. Instead of doing it every time it happens, I just did an every tick, which is actually sloppier. So if it's only there, that might be the only event too that moves it. Yeah, it is. So I'm going to move this up here. So whenever we change its Y coordinate, we also update the Y coordinate of that selection bar that's behind the text to the same position okay. as it. And then I can delete this. So let's run this to make sure I did not break everything. All right. Yeah, everything's still working exactly as it should. And eventually for certain platforms, actually for most platforms, you kind of need an exit the game thing. And yeah. we, we did work that into the design. I just haven't incorporated yet because it's so such a basic thing. But there's going to be like a little X icon or something, something at the top uh, left of the screen. And just make it so that there will be four menu options instead of three and one of them won't be made with the font it'll be its own thing but when you tap up from play it'll select that x i think i'm just gonna make the pointer disappear make this selection bar disappear 
and make the X pulse. So maybe you have text up here that says exit game when you select right. it. Yeah, that's I think that'll be best. And then uh, same thing if you're all the way on the bottom. If you tap down right now, it loops back around to play, but instead it'll loop back down to uh, exit game. But otherwise, all of this is functional. All right, so now let's go into... I'm going to run the game again right from the beginning just to give you the full experience here. So we've got our nice logo, splash screen, and then now I'm going to show you the cool uh, sort of settings menu system that... Uh, all right, so here we go here. Very cool. Uh, and it, this looks all functional and stuff, but for now, for this video, all I've gotten so far is that you can navigate up here and change the tabs to look at the different things that you're going to be able to do. And you can go back down here and navigate. Reset currently does nothing, but done will bring you back to the main screen. So that's all working. And Corey had a fantastic idea a while back and I wanted to talk about that a little and then any thoughts you have on it Corey but mm -hmm. I love the idea he had of creating a sort of Bitbeam Cannon themed master under the hood game option setting the same kind of settings that are going to be mostly ubiquitous across games or something that people are very much used to in emulators and stuff like that just a, a really nice retro casual and uh, give people that instant, no matter what game of ours they're going to be playing, there will be this instant comfort zone where you know exactly where the features are you want, you know how to set them, you know how to save them as default once you have it set the way you want, and mm -hmm. uh, it's just another form of branding. You can see it has the Bitbeam Cannon scan lines that we use in our background, the Bitbeam Cannon color scheme. Yeah, and yeah. I did design it very much 8-bit initially because I wanted it to be simple enough where if we did a game for any type of system... Right. It could look relatively the same, but there's mm -hmm. also the possibility of upgrading it for things like Amiga or something. Right, making it 16 to make it Make it a little nicer, right. you know, add more colors going right. on. Or, or maybe the colors being closer to our actual the exact, branding. I mean, right. they're, they're pretty close as is, right. but, you know, uh, it could Absolutely. get a little closer. Yeah. But I had the thought of, well, I'm going to make it simple at first and fairly generic. And if we wanted to, per right. game... Well, we we could swap out all the art to match, right. you know, whatever game Basically it is. Basically skin it to the theme of that game. I don't mind it being either way. Yeah. Uh, I think if someone saw it just one time in one mm. game, it might be confusing in that respect. But right. at the same time, if someone saw it a second time in a different game, it right. would make sense that it was this universal thing. So, right. You know, and maybe that's that's something our, our viewers could weigh in on in the comments or something. Like, how, how would you feel about that? Like, would you want to see it? Damon Claw themed. Right. The main design work here mm. is the layout, was, and, was the layout exactly. and getting it attractive enough to be yeah. uh, not just a, a regular line by line menu. Yeah, exactly. Because I've been to so many options screens in retro games yep. that were just, they just blast everything right there. And you're usually just looking for one thing. That's exactly it. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's how I was designing it until you reminded <laughs> me you did all this awesome design work. And then I kind of did a face. Well, I had almost forgotten because it had been a little while. And yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember like we might could use this. And yeah, uh, you know, and we so, should yeah. be because like I love that idea. The other th thing I was thinking while you were talking is I changed this from your design a bit. So you have the border for around the game. And so I just rearranged it a little bit. So instead of none, it's like black and then light and dark. And black is just a black border. And then light yeah. and dark. And then the other thing, I made a, a thing called touch buttons. Uh, I forget what... Uh, maybe that didn't exist at all. I can't remember. But basically, there's same thing. Light, dark, and then... So people can mix and match if mm -hmm. they want. But also basic instead of none. So like the, the game automatically detects if you pick up a control pad and start controlling that way or a keyboard 
It doesn't need to show you the buttons anymore, so it'll automatically hide the buttons. But when the buttons are there, you should be able to decide how they look. And basic will be like as minimalistic as possible wireframe. You right. know what I mean? Just like as out of the way of as possible, but you can still tell where it is so you can touch the right place on your screen for a touch screen game. So I was thinking we we theoretically have room for one more row of mm -hmm. basically imagine so this is like the the display thing and it's all about the skins so to speak and we could have a thing down here that says do you want to turn on the options menu daemon claw skin on or off like one yeah, toggle yeah, on or true. off that would be a really cool easy place to add it and if we do that we can just wait until the rest of the game is pretty much done and decide do we want to do the extra work of throwing that in as an option and then we could just set it on by default i would imagine yep and yeah, that was part of the the challenge of this is i was also trying to make sure if this was on touch screen or if mm. someone was using a mouse or whatever they were using that it would be pretty friendly right either way yeah uh, so that's the reason for a lot of the spacing of the buttons mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and things like that yep that gets tough when you're designing mm -hmm. one ui that can yeah. uh, cover all those things but i, th I think yeah. it's worked out uh, decently yeah. enough as oh yeah, as it's, it's beautiful. Layout, yeah. Even though the controls layout looks very attractive, right. I'm still not sure about that layout. Yeah, yeah. Because of uh, the if yep. you're using a gamepad, at least exactly. You know, it might yeah, be a little a little weird, but we'll see. For the vertical slice demo we're working on for the game, that'll just let you play up to and beat the level one boss, and then get into like, the first third of the level two. I'm probably not going to bother programming all of this functionality. So it'll be there, but stuff will be either grayed out or just li like right now, like you, you can't actually select the stuff. Right. You know what I mean? So all of this stuff, it might change slightly as we start programming it and go, oh, it will be even more convenient or more logical. It'll make obvious sense to people if we tweak it in one way or another. But the other cool thing uh, in Corey's work here. Because he knows we're working on projects that graphically mimic or someday might eventually run on the Sega Master System, 8-bit Nintendo. He needed to design something if he wanted us to be able to reuse this visually and code-wise in the construct-made versions of the games. It needed to be able to work universally given the different amounts of color on screen, the slightly different screen resolutions. And I think you really came up with a very nice, comfortable, easy to understand, and most important, really easy to navigate system that would look great. Like anyone, even playing a 16-bit game, no one's going to look at this and go, oh, you know what I mean? It's not, yeah. there's not <laughs> enough colors on there. It's so pretty and clean and retro and easy to use and easy to look at. But this yeah, would... Yeah, I was using, yeah. I was using Master System as my sort exactly. of... Uh, middle of the road zone because it's got less vertical space right. than things like the NES. And I was like, well, if it can fit on the SMS and right. look decent with that limited palette and everything, then yep. it could be on anything. You know, we could right. put it on an Amiga screen. We could put it on right. NES, anything. And uh, it would look nice. Right. And, yeah, and so. keep those limitations in mind, everyone. Mm -hmm. Corey, when he was designing this, he had to design it based on the memory and graphical limitations of the Sega Master System, where, like, now we're spoiled. We could just, you right. know, we yeah. could mock it up in Photoshop and put anything anywhere we want and have 50 different sized fonts, and none of them have to be aligned in a grid. He had to work where every letter fit in an exact 8x8 grid, no matter what. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 8x8 eight eight tiles, basically. Everything is created with 8x8 eight eight tiles, except for the hand pointer, which is, would be made out of sprites on the Master System. So, anyway, I think you did an amazing design job, both for visuals and functionality, and the fact that it will look great and work great across all of the platforms or simulated platforms that we have planned for all our games that we have uh, worked out so far. Now let's talk about how I got what is functioning so far functioning. Okay. So let's close this out and start getting into the code. As you can see, I added a new layout with its own event sheet called settings. And then there's a surprising number of layers in here that you normally wouldn't expect for a menu system. But keep in mind, this is like four different menu screens. 
Right. And it took a long time for me to figure out how I wanted to handle getting all these different menu options to show up when you select the different tabs and how I can organize that and manipulate it in code to have it all on one screen and all on one event sheet and basically not have to copy and paste a bunch of code for each particular tab of menu options. And then I realized is when you change tabs, we have to not show a bunch of options and show a bunch of things in a new way. And there's a function in Construct directly for that. It's called layers, which in events you can hide or show entire layers. So I was like, that's perfect. I'll just make a layer with the name of each tab, like uh, sound, display, controls, and system. And then all of the stuff, all of the menu options for that tab will be on that one layer. So whenever you're switching, I'm just going to add the code. I, I didn't even need to do that yet. I just have uh, one sprite that I'll show you what I did. I just have, unfortunately, you can't just name something 0, 1, 2, or 3. So I just did A0, A1, A2, A3. And you could see I just grabbed right out of the paint program from Corey's designs of the all the different tabs. I just grabbed all of that part that fills in the center. And so I just have the sprite change which animation it's playing based on which tab you've set. And this is a very sloppy hack way to do it, but it's also very useful for me because not only do I need the text to all be there anyway, and it would be kind of a waste of time and resources to actually carefully line up a bunch of actual bitmap fonts and stuff like that, but then it would take me a ton of work to hand recreate with code and with, you know, messing around in the layout editor perfectly position and count pixels like exactly where everything needs to go. So doing it this way, I've got myself a guide that already has the text that I need anyway. And then I'm, when I put the real menu options over these, I'll be placing them pixel perfect over the stuff that is right. just baked into this sprite. So that's what's already happening. But eventually what's going to happen is that all of these actual things like this numerical box that actually updates and changes based on there's a slider here that i haven't bothered putting in yet and then there's the mute button you should be able to navigate to or click on all of that stuff's going to be on the layer called sound and then so i'm just going to have an event so that if you are on the sound tab we show this layer and we hide all these other layers and the cool thing is in the logic, you can... Uh, oh, and then one last thing I should mention. We also have up here another sprite that is the whole top section that a uh, same exact method you can see, A0, A1. And depending on which tab you navigate to by pressing left or right, that's changing a variable that's called something like which tab, we'll see soon. And it just updates its animation. And an important thing is you could see here, if I click on the action points or image points, you could see I added a second image point to every animation. And this lets me organically set where the pointer should be centered. So that little hand that does the horizontal sine wave, nice. it gets placed. So when I switch the animation, I also say, okay, now update the position of that little pointer to be pointing at the new tab that is the one that's selected. And that's you could much see that handier than typing in some coordinates, <laughs> coordinates oh, or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. So that's how that works. And that's the gist of it as far as the stuff that's here. And then this is exactly the same. In, in fact, I even cloned the menu arrow from the splash screen, but I knew I wanted it to look different. Like we don't want this cartoony hand for the cool Damon Claw splash screen. We want probably the gauntlet or a cool arrow. Yeah, um, I was definitely thinking the gauntlet for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. So, and that it could even have its own little flame effect on it or something, which could be really cute. So, I just cloned it. It has the same horizontal movement, and we're doing the same trick, but now instead of setting it to the Y coordinate of whatever menu option is selected, now it has to move around in X and Y all over the screen, and it's going to be different depending on which tab you have selected. You can see the things are all arranged in very different ways. So that little hand needs to really be able to teleport around in an organic way. So that's when I realized the best solution for that was to have an image point for each thing you could navigate to that specifically designates where it's going to appear. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we can actually get into the code. So control E, and again, just like the main menu screen, we have player input included and fade out events. And then go back here quickly. What do we want to look at first? So what I did, since I knew 
the whole menu system has this particular sprite and Corey and I are going to want to copy and paste this entire menu system and reuse it in our other games and that it's difficult to construct but it's not impossible I figured out how a long time ago so it's definitely faster to do that than to reprogram everything from scratch for every game right, um, right. so I figured well this sprite has to come along with it in the migration so we'll just put the couple of necessary variables in here instead of making them a global variable to the game. Mm -hmm. So that's why they have which menu and which are right here. Which menu is like the which tab. I should rename that to which tab. Actually, I will. So this is going to be which mm -hmm. tab. There we go. All right. So here is the code. And... There's this thing I use, which you probably know from previous videos. I created a global value called weight, and I'm always checking if weight is zero. And then whenever a, the player does an input that changes navigation in any kind of menu, we set weight to five. And that basically makes it so it's impossible, no matter what kind of input the player is using, or even if they switch between one input and another, you can't get that accidental oh, I teleported two places to the right, even though I only tapped right once. And it also adds a cool little bonus where if I hold right, it'll go bloop, bloop, bloop over in a nicely timed way. So I don't have to keep pressing the button. I can just hold it and it'll just go and I can stop very easily by letting go when it reaches the option I want. So that's why I'm using this wait system here. And then you'll mm -hmm. see there is an event that says every 0.06 of a second, if weight is greater than zero, subtract one from it. So mm -hmm. that's just the way to control the exact timing between each menu switch that you can do. And then, so up, down is greater than zero. And I have up, down, and left, right, because you, you can never do the opposite direction at the same time. So I just use one global value to represent you're either pressing up or down or not, or left or right or not. So up, down is greater than zero. That means someone is holding down. If they did, you set weight to five, so you, you can't do it again immediately. And then now we need to go through a loop to check each of the... Uh, let me see what I'm doing here. So I added menu buttons. There's a few different sprites, and in this case it is... Let's go back into the settings layout. So that would be this, done button and reset button. Those are currently the only two menu buttons, but eventually everything you can navigate to is going to be a menu button. So I started by making these two because they're the only ones we need right now for the core functionality. And so you can see they have variables in there. One is which, and it's going to be from zero through whatever it needs to be per tab to add all the features you can navigate to. And it's going to be like the top leftmost one is zero, and then going left and downward, like if you're reading Western text. And then there's these other variables, which are interesting because they tell the game logic, if the player is currently on this menu button, does up go somewhere? And if so, where does it go? What new button or what other button should it navigate to if you press up? What should it navigate to if you press down, left, and right? And then, oh, those are old ones that I meant to delete. Like, at first, I didn't realize I was going to put them in a group. Mm -hmm. And so I renamed them X so I could name the group variables the same thing, just up, down, left, and right. There we go. So that's better organized. Same thing here. I'll delete those. All right. So they have the group values. And then let's go back into this here. So this is saying which has to be negative one. So that's in the tops, which is the tabs. Mm -hmm. I might rename that to tabs sprite for clarity. When the tabs sprite, when its value which is set to negative one, that means it's up on itself. It's up at the tabs section. I gave that a value of negative one because it's not one of the menu options for the settings. It's like the navigation up on top. And then, so if that is true and you're amongst those and you press down, then we're going to go through a loop through all of the menu buttons that exist and look for the one that is matching its value, which, which in the case of 
as an example. See how, all right, so this is considered negative one if you're up here. And then this is a witch of zero. So when you tap down once, the number is going to change from negative one to zero. So let's go back here. So you can see we're setting which to zero. Mm -hmm. So now it checks which one of these menu buttons has the value zero to match what is supposed to be currently selected. So then when it finds that one, it's going to play the sound beep like you navigated. And then we're going to call a function which I called update which, and again, it's the same kind of problem. Because we just narrowed down to this specific one, if I try to do anything to one of these things, it's going to affect that one. And I don't want to affect that one. I want to affect the one it's going to now. Mm -hmm. So that, that is a tricky, it's kind of convoluted or confusing, but hopefully it makes sense. And then on function update which, and then we're just looping through all of the menu buttons. We're finding which one is the current value of the navigation. And we are setting the position of that little hand pointer to mm -hmm. that action point we made that specifically designates where to put it. Nice. And we are resetting its sine wave movement. And the reason we're doing that is it, sine wave movement is moving uh, in a four pixel range and you don't want it to sort of get more out of whack if you go up and down and left and right to teleport it to all the different things. It could get sort of misaligned more than you want it to because you've teleported it in a at one of its extremes four pixels out and now it's treating mm -hmm. that as it's like central. Yeah, and with this low res, I mean... I you know, that four makes, pixels that can, can make, make a pretty big difference exactly uh, you know so i'm just restarting its position of its sine wave movement so it's always exactly the same every time that you navigate to that thing just a visual polish making sure nothing gets out of whack in the alignment so that's what that does and then we have to stop the loop this is interesting because so we're doing this loop and this bug wasted so much of my time i couldn't <laughs> figure out i was getting even though i have weight equals zero i'm checking every time and i'm setting weight to five i was getting the instantaneous teleport you press left once or down once and it goes down twice and i was like how is that possible but without stopping the loop here's what it was doing it's going through each of these and it's checking if its witch matches the current witch but then it increments the current witch as you can see here in this case it's setting it to zero but there are other ones further down where it's incrementing it right so if you increment it and then you loop back this is going to be true again it's going to find one that is matching the current one and you end up with this infinite cascade where it pushes it forward and then it does the loop again and it took me so long to realize, oh yeah, of course, I need to stop the loop as soon as it finds it the first time. So we don't let it loop through all of them because it's going to keep being true. Every new one is going to be, <laughs> yes, I am the correct one. And it's going to keep incrementing that number. But anyway, so that's how that one works. And this is the same exact kind of thing. Also for if which is negative one. And this is going to, this is the actual navigation through the different tabs. So this is to go down to the done button. That's what it's looking for down. That's what this is going to do. And then mm -hmm. right now it goes specifically to the down button because it's the only button set to zero. But remember, once I add all the actual buttons that you can navigate to to change all the settings, it won't be the down button. It'll be just the next logical settings button that you want to navigate down to once you've gone to the tab you want. But right now it goes to the down button. Yeah. So now we've got the pressing right because left, right, if it's greater than zero, that's to the right. So they're holding or pressed right. And then they're on the tab selection uh, menu option, basically. And fade equals zero, I should remind people. Fade is zero if the game is not fading out to go to a new screen. You don't want people to keep navigating and pressing new menu options when you've already selected something and the game is trying to get the hell out of that screen and fade <laughs> to the next one. And then we're doing the same exact kind of stuff, but the difference is which value we're changing, which you could see now because you pressed right. We're adding one to which tab instead of which. Which mm -hmm. is which menu button which tab is which tab that you're navigating to and then again we're increasing weight to five so you can't teleport through several options at once and then we're playing the little beep and then 
if which tab equals four, because there's only four and it starts at zero, so the numbers for each tab is zero, one, two, and three. So if you've pressed right and now it goes to four, we can't have that. It should loop back around to zero. So that's what this does. The sub event says, okay, you've done this, but this is dangerous because now it may have incremented which tab to four, which doesn't exist. So we just immediately do a check, is it four? And if so, set it to zero. And that just seamlessly makes it loop around to zero, to okay. the first tab. And then I use, remember how I named the animations A and then a number? Mm -hmm. That was specifically because of a construct limitation where you can't just name the animation zero, one, two, three. So I have to use kind of a formula that is the name of the animation and a in quotes and then the at or ampersand symbol and then string and then which tab so it combines it all together and so if you've just navigated to the second tab which is tab one it would be a1 so we tell right. the tops thing to play animation a1 which makes it look like it went to the next tab and we do the same thing with the menu bgs which has the exact same menu bg sprite which has the same exact naming convention mm -hmm. so that updates the whole screen to look like you've navigated to the new tab of options and this is exactly the place where i'm eventually going to have the code so it's going to be a sub event and it's going to be check what tab it's on and show that particular corresponding layer and hide the other layers so that those particular buttons are visible. Again, we need to update the position of the little hand. So we're just updating its position to the image point on the tab. So now that we change the animation, we can immediately update its position. And even though it's image point one, in every animation, image point one is in the proper new spot. And then the same exact thing, we want to make sure it doesn't go in a weird place. So we're resetting the sine wave movement. Right. And th this is the same exact thing, but now it's for when you press to the left. So all the lo logic is exactly the same, but now obviously we need to make sure that if you end up with a number, because we're subtracting one from which tab, Mm -hmm. So now we're making sure if it's below zero, which does not exist, you loop back to tab three, which is the last tab. And then yeah. otherwise the logic is exactly the same. And then this is our thing that makes weight go back to zero. And then, okay, so this also, we trigger it once. If someone just navigated back up to the tab navigation, we need mm -hmm. to get that hand up there in the proper position. So that's all that does is because it's trigger once, which tab, it only happens if this just happened, if this is a change. Like that means which was not negative one and now it is. You know, I had a thought too. Yep. I would imagine a lot of people, if they played maybe a non-Amiga version of this game, they would likely have a controller that has shoulder buttons and you right. could actually build it into this menu where you could show. Oh yeah, to tabs tab. Left, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You know, that, yeah, that we'll would do be that. a handy. Um, yeah. Just, I mean, in addition yeah. to what's already there, you know, it could still yeah. function this way, but right. that could be. Yeah, uh, that's I a great idea. That initially, but you that's know. a great idea. And the Amiga CD32 controller has shoulder buttons, so it'll. Oh yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Uh, we could uh, make it work in the real Amiga version the same way. All right, so back to this. We already know what this one does. Oh yeah, so yeah, we're just updating again the position of the hand in the right spot and resetting the sine wave. And then, so now we have if tops which equals zero, which currently is the done button and trigger once, same thing. And we just want to get, uh, oh yeah, so this shouldn't be zero actually. This should just be, it's not equal to negative one. So, so long as it is not up in the tabs, does that make sense? Right. If mm -hmm. it's not in the tabs, then we're guaranteed that it should be at one of the menu buttons, right? What we're doing is if you're not on the tabs and this is this just happened, it just switched off from being negative one. We go for each menu button, we have to find out which one is selected. We know we're not on the tab now, so what menu button should the hand go to? And then we just set its position to that image point we set up for that button, and we reset the, the tab. So this is all really straightforward. But like it's all the same kind of logic. And here we go again, this is for if you've pressed to the right, but you are not on the tab. So you can see here, it's not negative one. And then now we're checking, okay, so now I can't just put the stuff here that does stuff other than setting weight to five, because we don't know 
if pressing right is a valid thing you can do in this circumstance. Right. right? Yeah. So that's where I put in that cool thing so we can very visually, that's why we have these variables in here, up, down, left, or right, that'll tell us. And I, I made it so that if it's not valid to press left to navigate away from this button, what I would do is I would set left to be negative 99. That's completely arbitrary, but I know I'll never have 99 or especially not negative 99 buttons. Mm -hmm. So it's just a safe thing that's easy for me to remember that I can set it whenever that, like whenever up, down, left, or right is invalid navigation away from that button, you set it to negative 99. Otherwise, if pressing up should bring me to negative one, which is the tabs, I set up to be negative one. And in this case, because there's no other button, up goes to negative one, but also down should loop around to negative one. So you'll see up and down are both negative one. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's how that all works. I hope that makes sense. And so the nice thing is we can set these buttons up wherever we want and then decide visually what should up do from this button and then just type it right in. So right. it allows yeah. us to arrange and rearrange every menu however we want on each layer that's specific to that thing. And it's always going to work. And on each layer, there's always going to be a button zero, one, two, three, four, but they're going to be different per tab and it's going to be based on the layer. So right now we're not checking based on the layer. Mm -hmm. But eventually we're going to have, where's that for each again? So for each menu button, instead of just checking, does it equal which one you're navigated to? It's also going to check menu buttons. Is it on the appropriate layer that is visible? Right. So it's mm -hmm. not, it's not going to give a crap. It's going to skip right over all of the menu buttons with the same which value if they're not visible because you're not on that tab. So that right. allows me to use this one set of code and it'll work for all navigation amongst all the tabs. Nice. Yeah. So like uh, none of that really sloppy, I'm just going to copy and paste, you know, right. and, and like now it's for if you're in the display thing and all that stuff. So anyway. Well, and too, that, you know, if being designed to be sort of universal mm -hmm. to be reused or something, uh, yeah, I think getting it nice and clean right. and polished and everything initially is, is a great idea before we ever duplicate it. You right. Know? Uh, and the, the other really cool thing is maybe some games, maybe it won't make any sense to have some of these features. Right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. So all we have to do is literally delete that button mm -hmm. and then it just works. Like it's ah, like, yeah, and then ch yeah. we'll have to change the numbers a tiny bit, but very little. Because even if like, let's say we got rid of button number three, mm -hmm. because it's based on, well, you had to be at a previous button and that one's down or left or right tells you where to go. So even if you eliminate button three and you want it to go to button four instead, you just change the buttons that used to navigate to, to three, you change that value three to four. So even in that case, there's very little you have to change. You don't have to change any of the code or events. You just tweak a couple of those variables around the now missing button. And it's the same thing for adding a whole new feature and a whole new button. You just right. add that value to the buttons that should be able to navigate to it. And then it works without nice. adding new code. Or at least its navigational aspect works. Obviously, if it does a very special thing like changing global volume of the sound, then yeah, you and need that to, could also yeah. be true if we ever needed to add more tabs or anything too. Exactly. Yep. Uh, my my concept was like I really don't like on a retro style system heavy scrolling going on like a big scroll bar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And going through, I was like, I like that break it up each into of these tabs. could all fit on the screen and it's all yeah. visual and that because it's not fun when you can't see something that could be important like maybe right. at the bottom of the options or something right and and it I just gets monotonous. everything on screen and tidy right and, yeah it just so. gets way more monotonous to have to navigate scroll down a mm -hmm. giant phone book page you know if you've got this giant wall of text you have to scroll through to find your yeah. option that's yeah. just not fun not ergonomic as we would say and, and it doesn't let you get into the gameplay as fast and as convenient and comfortably as possible so anyway uh back to the code so yeah, if right is a valid option because right is not negative 99, now we know we can do something. Now we know we should navigate to the new thing. 
But again, we've got this problem now because we just picked out the specific one that you are navigated on. And now we want to affect the one or get the data from the one that it's supposed to navigate to. So we can't just do that directly. So I have to call another function. Right. So it's set which value to the current one's right value, which now says, okay, now you've selected the thing that you should be able to navigate to by pressing right. And then you play the beat because we now know you've made a valid menu navigation. And again, stop the loop because otherwise you'd have the infinite problem where it would just teleport across all of the buttons. Of course, it would stop if there was no longer a valid right navigation, but it would, right. you know, it's still a big unpredictable mess. And then so that now we call the function update which, which again, it's going to go through all of them, see which one is the new navigation value, like where are we now? And we're going to update the position of the pointer. And that's exactly the same. We just have the same exact thing over and over again for whether or not you pressed up, down, left, or right. It's the same exact logic. So very straightforward. Yeah. You don't need to go through those one at a time. And then the very last thing I did so that you can go back to, which is like, this is very placeholder, just so you can make sure you can go back to the splash screen. And that's mm -hmm. this one right here. If weight is zero, so you can make another menu input validly. It's not forcing you to wait a split second. And fade is zero. You haven't done something that would fade it out yet. Which is zero, which currently, like this is the hard coded part. Eventually the done button might not be zero, right? Right. But I will probably eventually give it a pot. Like I'll probably make that positive 99 because we'll never have 99 other buttons. Like that'll be a safe way, like we'll know that's 99, you know what I mean? So I'll probably change that hard coding to 99 and change the done button to 99. And then B1 is greater than zero, which simply means the player pressed button one. And that can be on the keyboard, that can be on the touch buttons, that could be with a controller. And then now we finally set fade to one. So now none of those events can work anymore. And it's starting to fade out. We set we are two to splash that tells it once it's done fading in that opaque black fade out sprite that covers the whole screen that creates that fading in and out effect uh, mm -hmm. as soon as that is completely opaque so now we know we're free to switch to the other layout it goes to the splash screen plays the selected sound and it fades back out and it will go once it's done to the splash screen Nice. And that is it. That is the code that we've done recently. I did want to just really quickly mention probably each tab is going mm -hmm. to be an entire video unto itself. But Corey and I brainstormed a bit more and worked out some really cool additional gameplay features and tweaks. So the next video, so to keep things lively and not, it'll get boring if we're working on menus for five videos in a row. So right, in the next yeah. video, we will be adding some cool new tweaks to the gameplay. So stay tuned for that. And I think unless you have any uh, last minute thoughts or questions or things we well, should... Yep. There, there was one thing I wanted to mention about this menu that I designed uh, really mm -hmm. quickly is that the idea behind it was these are the settings that would be not only potentially universal for any game, but also things that you could set at any time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the thought was that the game's options, things like easy mode or whatever pertaining to that stuff that you wouldn't want to be able to set in the middle of gameplay. Right. That was the thought is that they would either be somewhere else or only show up if you accessed it from the main menu or something. Oh, well, yeah, that's and a great this, point. And yeah. this kind of stuff, you know, because we were building these border interfaces, mm -hmm. and you could always do this with a gamepad right. button or, or a, a keyboard key press. Right. press as well. <clears throat> Whereas, like, you know, you might... In this one, we designed the little escape key, or in, on others, it's a start button or what have you. Yeah. You know, there could be that button in the corner that at any time while you're playing, this menu can be accessed. Yeah. Because you might get halfway through a level and say, oh, I, the sound effects are too loud or mm -hmm. what have you. And you might want to change any of these things or adjust the <clears> controls <throat> or anything. But things like I want to play the game on easy mode, we obviously wouldn't want that sort of stuff yeah. at any moment. So the, the concept behind this initially was this was a quick access set anything you want at any time for the app, so to speak, yeah. uh, you know, uh, even though I, I really don't like that term. Kind of the under the hood yeah. stuff that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it is a discussion we'll have to have later about 
how to separate out the gameplay stuff. Yeah. It could be as simple as an extra tab there. Yeah, exactly. When you access from the main menu. That's what I was going to say. Uh, a hidden, it, yeah. a so. hidden tab would be so cool. Like if you go in from the main menu, there's one more tab that is a difficulty setting. Mm-hmm. And then if you, and that might uh, expand some games, you might be able to, like, there's a lot of, like, some of the best games made on the Amiga are some of their shmups. One of the cool things about that is it wasn't just like a raw difficulty, easy, medium. Like, you could go in and you could set number of enemy bullets on screen allowed, uh, right. movement speed yeah, of there, the enemy bullets. Yeah, there's going to be stuff. Yeah, there's going to yeah. be stuff like that for each there Each could be game that's unique yeah. and i yeah. don't know there may be more for this game other than difficulty uh yeah. if if we think of them you know yeah so but so yeah that having one tab or, yeah. or screen dedicated to that uh, yeah. that that is only like oh before you start playing right from the thing, splash uh, screen seems to make sense to me so, right yeah because i didn't show this yet but it's in your promotion project mm -hmm. file you made like a uh, pop-up menu that would appear presumably when you pause the game or pause mm -hmm. the game and, and like press select or something, it would bring you up to the kind of more hardcore behind the hood. Like maybe regular pause would just pause the screen and say paused. Maybe. Uh, yeah, or maybe yeah, it would just immediately yeah. show this whole thing. But at any rate, we haven't decided yet exactly how, but in a very simple way, you would pull up this menu that's like, okay, I've paused the game, but I want to switch one of these things around, change the border, change the volumes, like a really quick, easy way to get into this menu system. So when you did it that way, that tab would be missing is a, a really cool idea. I really like that idea. Yeah, yeah. It seems like an easy thing to turn on and off based yeah, on what exactly. you've made. So yeah, yeah. Right. But that, that's all I was going to say about that uh, for, for anyone that might wonder why something like the difficulty settings might not have appeared in this is because I was trying to design this aspect of right. it first and then per game it would have its own separate uh, yeah. screen so all right well awesome thanks so much everyone for watching thank you very much Corey for as always the awesome design and graphics work and making this video a lot more lively and entertaining and mm -hmm. uh, that's it stay tuned for the next video if you enjoy our content and want to keep up to date on our games, please leave a like and subscribe. Also, if you want to support our projects, consider becoming a patron. The link's in the description, and we'll see you soon.